One of the greatest intellectuals this world has ever seen, Benjamin Franklin, once said, if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. Well, I can guarantee you that at SSPT, we plan ahead. And that goes for all of our powerlifters that we work with uh, in terms of game day coaching from the most novice, the, the first time lifter, all the way up to elite world champions. And of course, everyone in between. We matter of factly install competition game plans beforehand. And that is a very important process or a component, I should say, of our competitive process. Uh, it's something that we do without fail with every single lifter that we work with. And uh, oftentimes, you know, we're coaching lifters that we don't uh, coach in person, that we don't write programming for. And it's not uncommon for us to show up at a national championships and have somewhere between anywhere between a dozen and 20 lifters that have hired us for our expertise in game day coaching. And so part of our process is to uh, facilitate conversation, naturally communicate with them every step of the way, follow their training. Uh, if they have training that is written by someone other than themselves, if they're working with a coach, then of course we invite their coach into that process. And it is a very cohesive, collaborative process. Um, we are dictators. Uh, however, we are being hired for our acumen in game day coaching and our many years of expertise. And so that collaboration uh, helps to facilitate all of those things. So this video is going to discuss what our game planning process looks like. One of the things that we talk about all the time uh, with our lifters, depending upon their experience level and, of course, the level of the competition, uh, as well as their goals, are scenarios, game day scenarios. What's going to happen on game day? Well, that is something that we plan for. And so oftentimes we'll plan for the worst and rather than hope for the best, uh, hope is not an action, action strategy. Um, making plans is an action strategy. Uh, therefore, we like to consider and uncover just about every potential scenario that could happen on game day. And so in consideration of those scenarios, we have plagues called. And so matter of factly, when something happens, uh, we, we have a game plan and a play already called in our minds. And that's not to say that we're so rigid or inflexible that we can't adapt to the situation because certainly we can and, and we need to be uh, flexible at times. However, uh, in a pressure cooker situation where you only have 60 seconds to make your decision in terms of the next attempt, uh, we don't like being blindsided. And so we our, our, our faith um, is steeped in our consistency and our effort and our preparation. And so in doing all those things, we consider these various scenarios. And I'm going to share those scenarios in that video with you. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to discuss uh, some, some variables to consider uh, in terms of a potential training review. Not necessarily going to do a deep dive on how to consider the training, but mention um, some key points. And then, of course, lastly, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through our game plan installation process where I show you the nuts and bolts uh, and our example template. Uh, and I will do that for lifters of various strength levels. So I'm glad you're here. And let's go ahead and dive in. As I said in the introduction, our game planning discussion begins with the scenarios that we consider. So our process, once we uh, install the game plan, again, that is a collaborative process. We will get on a video call with our lifter and their coach, if they have one, we bring everybody into the conversation. Uh, while we don't want too many cooks in the kitchen, it's definitely valuable to consult with the coach if uh, the lifter is uh, not self-coached, uh, because that coach, matter of factly, has seen the lifter's lifts uh, probably more than anyone, and they literally and figuratively have their finger on the pulse of that lifter's training. So we begin with uh, the discussion of various scenarios. And the key is planning ahead so that you do not get blindsided. Powerlifting competitions are fluid situations. They are not static environments. Uh, things change and oftentimes uh, at the last minute and you have to be willing to adapt and overcome. And so one of the things we like to do is, is plan for various 
scenarios that could potentially happen. Um, you know, sometimes these are things that are completely outside of your control, like the change of the schedule or a last minute change of venue or the equipment that they announced was being used is now somehow different and those sorts of things. And we intentionally choose to focus on the things that are within our control, within our circle of control, and pretty much everything outside of that circle is trivia and does not serve to help us uh, in achieving our objectives. But in terms of specific scenarios, I have five listed here in my game day coaching manual. I go into others. This is not by any means an exhaustive list of potential scenarios, but one that you want to consider is, are you going to increase the weight after missing an opener? And that's certainly going to depend upon the lifter themselves, the level of the competition, um, their goals, their circumstances, so on and so forth. With a first time novice, chances are we're not going to increase after a missed opener. Um, now, if they're just really, really nervous and they kind of had a brain cramp, so to speak, and they, they waited for the squat command and they squatted super deep and it looked like it was about an RPE2, but they raced into the rack, uh, we might consider going up to the second attempt, but this is going to come on a case-by-case -case basis. Suffice it to say, I'm not going to go into a tremendous amount of detail with every single scenario here, but these are things to consider. If the second attempt is missed on a technicality, but it otherwise moved well and it felt good, are we then going to increase to the planned third attempt? And again, these are conversations that you need to have with your lifter and their programming coach uh, in advance of the competition because you don't want to be discussing this back and forth with the lifter when you only have 60 seconds to submit the next attempt. This is what I mean by having a play called. So that when this happens, you say, hey, look, we're looking right at our play sheet. We discussed this on our, bl on our game planning call, and this is, this is the, the play that we're calling. At a World Championships, if a lifter is, is in contention for an individual medal, because at World Championships they give medals for the individual lifts and not just the total or the overall placing. So if we've got a lifter who's in contention for an individual medal, and let's say the squat or the bench, are we willing to increase our opener if we don't have the lot number advantage. And again, uh, these are conversations that you have to determine beforehand. Um, I do not have a stock reply uh, to that answer personally. I think it, it is lifter dependent and it also depends upon how much you have to bump the opener up. Uh, my kind of standard rule for that is if we have to increase the opening attempt outside of their opening strength zone, if you will, which I like to deem as 90 to 92%. Our sweet spot at SSPT is about 91%. So we typically open at about 91% of our current PB. Um, but having said that, if it takes us outside of that beyond 92%, say if we're up at 93, 94%, then my answer is typically no, because what is going to happen is that is going to diminish your strength reserves. It's going to use up more gas in the tank than you'd planned. And it is then going to require, or basically mandate, if you will, a smaller second attempt. And so um, I do believe in probably keeping the opener where it was and then playing the game and trying to gain the advantage or move ahead by the second or third. But there are situations where I would consider uh, bumping an opener. How many placings are you willing to risk uh, losing based on your third deadlift. Again, these are goal-specific uh, conversations that have to be had between the game day coach and the lifter so that we know in advance, so that feelings don't get hurt. And, you know, uh, when emotions are running high, we want to give objective, unemotional feedback to our lifter. And we don't want to get caught up in our feelings. And so, uh, oftentimes those could be tense situations. And so by discussing all this stuff in advance, when there is no adrenaline, when there is no pressure, when we're, there's no clock, we're all just chilling and talking on a, on a video call, it's best to have the play called so that if and when these things do happen, we can just move right along and not even blink in the face of adversity. If the lifter's placing is secure, are we just going to add to the total with the final deadlift or aggressively aim for a personal best or potentially a national or world record regardless of how the second attempt moves? So I gave an example of this 
uh, this past year in the 76 kilo class at IPF Classic Worlds in Malta. And of course, I'm not picking on a lifter, but I, this just comes to mind. You had, um, and now her name escapes me, but the American, uh, Dana McNeil. Dana McNeil decided with her final deadlift to go ahead and increase her lift and go for a world record, or not, uh, was it, yes, we go for a world record in the deadlift in the 76 kilo class. Now, as many of you are aware, Jessica Bittner holds the world record in the deadlift. I believe it's 261.5 kilos. And anyway, Dana bumped her third deadlift up, and uh, I didn't think that was a good move at all. Uh, she went out, and the bar barely even came off the floor. So uh, when she could have just taken a more pragmatic or nominal increase to the third attempt and checked off a lot of boxes, uh, potentially hit a personal best in the deadlift, uh, would have gotten her, I believe, a gold medal in the deadlift, or at least moved her up in the deadlift ranking, and then of course uh, moved her up in the placing as well. So uh, the YOLO attempt, uh, in my opinion, was ill-advised and uh, you know just not not a smart decision. But again, it's not my decision; it's the lifter's decision. And if they want to throw caution to the wind and try those things, it's important to know in advance. So again, on game day, so that you you know you matter of factly as a game day coach are serving the lifter, you're serving your athlete, you're an employee for your lifter, and you want to do whatever you can to best serve them. And people have different goals. So let's get into a brief discussion of training review and just some, some considerations. And I told you at the outset, we were not going to do a deep dive in terms of the training review, but here are a few things that you want to look at. You want to examine the current training data. So what, is, what do the data say in terms of, hey, how did the prep go? How did, how, did, how did this training block or this peaking block, you know, um, how did the lifter perform? And you want to compare that versus their recent performances. What are the trends at their recent competitions? And all that is within consideration of their all-time personal bests as well as their goals and objectives for, that, for this competition. And their objectives and goals for this competition are likely going to be dependent upon this first component here, Right? If their training went really well, uh, you know, then in all likelihood, they're going to want to go after some PBs. Uh, and if they've had a, a history of bad performances, in all likelihood, they're going to want to get that bad taste out of their mouth and right the ship, so to speak, make more lifts and have a good performance. One thing that a lot of coaches uh, consider is estimated 1RM. That's estimated 1RM, uh, 1 rep max. And so that's like, you know, uh, taking a lift, uh, you know, let's say 200 kilos and you do that at an eight RPE and it, it could be for a single or a double or what have you. And you estimate one RM based on that data and based on that RPE scale that you've used, whether it's reps in reserve or just, you know, RPE in terms of the rating of perceived exertion in terms of how hard that set was from a one to a 10. And so there are a lot of coaches out there who believe that estimated one RM serves as a reliable proxy for attempt selection. I do not share that sentiment at all. Uh, the estimated 1RM provides us with a, a snapshot, a moment in time. And so what it is best used for, in my opinion, is to compare certain times in training. Uh, and your estimated 1RM for that day does not guarantee that you will be able to hit X weight on the next set, the next day, the next training day, uh, at the competition two weeks from now, or any other time for that matter. Um, it is, it, it's just a snapshot of a moment in time that allows you to compare your performance on that particular day versus your performance on another particular day. What I like to rely upon is going back to the training data. What are the trends? What, what do the data say in terms of lifter performance when your lifter has done X? Uh, what's the Y at the end of the equation, you know? Um, does X lead to Y, and so forth. And so I also rely heavily upon bar speed. Uh, if you have access to a, uh, an accelerometer and, and something that measures bar velocity, I think that can be an incredibly useful tool in terms of uh, estimating and gauging capability. Uh, I think it's far more valuable in a lot of cases than estimated 1RM. I also weigh heavily on a coach's eye. A, a keen and sharp coach's eye 
in my opinion, can, can trump a lot of other things. Uh, a coach who knows their lifter and their athlete and the nuances of the way that they move, the way that they strain under load, their habits, their tendencies, etc., cetera, are, are more likely to be able to predict, hey, my lifter just hit that lift, and, and I know, based upon experience, that they are good for an additional uh, 10 kilos or an additional 5 kilos. And so you can set up... Um, game plans based on uh, bar speeds. Again, if you have a reliable amount of training data, um, I have been using either a Tendo unit. I began using a Tendo unit in 2012. Um, so I have accumulated uh, a tremendous amount of data with that. Now I use a, a, a Rep1 uh, a unit. And so I have, uh, matter of factly, over 11 years of data. And so that's very reliable. And so having that information uh, provides uh, a pretty reliable um, end point for me. And also based on coach's eye and based on my wife, Susie, and looking at attempts and looking at my heavy lifts, we're able to uh, prognosticate fairly accurately where I'm going to be on game day. Uh, let's get into our final topic down here, and that's just additional variables to consider. Uh, naturally, you want to consider your lifter's attitude. And what I mean by that is their overall mindset. Uh, you know, are they a positive person or a negative person? Is their glass uh, perpetually half full or half to empty? You know, do they have a champion's mindset? Are they able to block out a lot of things that are trivial and that don't matter? Uh, when bad things happen, are they able to compartmentalize and overcome those things? And then, of course, when I talk about confidence, not only am I talking about just general confidence, but their feelings about the current prep. How did the training period go leading into this competition? What are their execution habits? You know, do they have a history of executing well? Uh, anybody can be a good gym lifter, um, you know, or a good lifter for the gram, you know, posting uh, great sets on Instagram and so forth is not uh, indicative of game day performance. Uh, so we have to know, are they one that competes well? Do they execute well when they have to get weighed in, when they are on someone else's time clock, someone else's itinerary, and under the scrutiny of strict judging? There's been a lot of discussion lately uh, in the past year or so with regards to travel and in, uh, to competition. And you have two, two camps, <laughs> and you have a, a camp of people who say that travel doesn't matter, and uh, you know it's a variable that you consider, but... Uh, that it really doesn't matter, and, and, and here is the data to prove that, and here are the world champions to prove that, and their success stories, and so on and so forth. And equally, on the opposing side, you have a camp of people who say that travel does matter, that it is a huge factor, that it should be considered. And they point to evidence of performances that dip at uh, competitions where lifters have had to travel very far. And I will say this, I think I meet somewhere in the middle. I do think that it can be a humongous factor. The fact is, is that travel hits and affects every single person differently. Bodies respond differently to travel. Some people travel quite well, and uh, it really doesn't um, bother them. And other times, uh, you know, some people just really get slammed and just overwhelmed. And, and really more important than the distance traveled or is the time zones that you're crossing. So I will say this, uh, while it is and can be a huge factor, if you prepare in advance and consider and get to the competition early, then it's not as much of a factor and you can perform at your all time best and hit PBs and so on and so forth. Uh, you don't want to fall in to the trap uh, of feeling like, oh gosh, travel is going to crush me, and then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Weight loss is certainly an additional variable to consider. Many times lifters will hit uh, PBs in training, and one of the first questions that I will ask them, or ask their, their coach that writes their programming, is uh, what's their body weight? And so when they are, you know, matter of factly overweight, they are going to be a different person on game day. So weight loss and the weight cut is an additional variable to consider when making uh, and installing game plans. Uh, the other factor uh, going back to weight loss, but also just their training is, uh, you know, if they hit a bench PB, I often ask, well, did they squat first? And if they didn't squat first, then that's a different data point. That's not a competition bench press data point that's really reliable in a powerlifting setting, maybe in a bench-only uh, setting, but not in a powerlifting competition. 
So weight loss uh, and, and the order of the training uh, is important. You know, if you, if you do a deadlift and you hit a PB because that's the standalone uh, cornerstone lift of the training day, but you didn't squat or bench first, it's not going to be as reliable as if you did it under some fatigue. What does the venue look like? And the reason that I mention this is because some people, uh, you know, compete well at local competitions in, in smaller gym settings, but then when they have to go somewhere and it's essentially an away game and they're in a ballroom or an events center, uh, you know, and it's unfamiliar to them, uh, that can be an additional variable to consider. Uh, also, the proximity of the washroom to the venue and, of course, the warm area, all of these things can play a role in terms of installing the game plan and, and the play calls. The time of day. Are you used to training in the morning, but your competition is late at night and vice versa? So that's certainly a variable. The time of day can throw you off, but much like the camp uh, that says the travel is not necessarily a factor, Time of day really shouldn't be necessarily a big factor if you plan for it. And last, but certainly not least, or I shouldn't even say last because there's some other variables here. This is not necessarily an exhaustive list, but it's just one that I've thought of kind of on the fly. And I get into more of these in my game day coaching manual. But of course, flight size. And what I mean by that is how many lifters are in a flight. Typically, the maximum flight size is 14 and the minimum is 6. And so if you have a heavier, stronger lifter and they are caught or stuck in a smaller flight, that is going to be something to consider. Uh, they're going to have a quick turnaround, and that does not uh, lend itself to supreme level performances. But anyway... Uh, and, and likewise, if they're in a longer flight, then you have, you know, uh, the, the opportunity per, to perhaps uh, get more rest time in between attempts and hit some personal bests. But these are some of the variables that we consider when installing our competition game plans. And now what I would like to do is actually get into the nuts and bolts of our competition game plans and show you uh, how we put all of that together. Here's a look at the SSPT game plan worksheet that we use for every one of our lifters from first time novices, again, all the way up through elite level world champions and everyone in between. You've likely seen iterations of a sheet like this um, that many other powerlifting coaches are using. This is just one that I built and I believe it works well for us. So uh, in our make believe example here, we have Wonder Woman competing. Uh, at 2023, PA Raw Nationals, so this is an example of, uh, of a meet that's already passed. Uh, and what I did in this worksheet is, is I created a drop-down menu here of every single class that you could encounter uh, through uh, from, from juniors all the way up through M5. And so you just find the one that corresponds to your lifter. She's a female. She's lifting in the open. I did the same thing here for every single weight class, both the uh, old traditional weight classes as well as the IPF weight classes. So you'll find every single iteration there. So we just select 52 kilos. Uh, this is an area where I usually write their platform and flight assignment. So in this particular case, we're pretending that she's in platform 1A and this is reserved for the lot number. So I reserved her as uh, lot number 7. And so if we work our way down the worksheet here, you'll see that it's essentially blank. The attempts aren't written in, the warm-ups aren't written in yet, but what we always want to start with is we want to start by filling out the fields of what are their competition PBs in each particular discipline, squat, bench, dead, and total. What did they do at their last competition? So we write all that in. Uh, and in this case, we include their personal best for IPF good lift points because that's what Powerlifting America uses as the IPF affiliate. And we write in their training best. Occasionally, this field here, instead of training best, if they're going after a national or world record, occasionally we would write uh, the record in here and then have it there just for notation, or we would create another field here. But in this particular case, for Wonder Woman, uh, we've written in her training best. And so you'll notice in the squat, it's 145 kilos uh, for a single at a nine and, and, and so on and so forth for the other two lifts. Importantly, we leave a little field over here for objectives and notes. And occasionally 
if we don't write objectives here, in this case we did. Uh, she wants to go nine for nine. She wants to hit a personal best in the deadlift. And specifically, you know, she's cracking on that 400 pound door, which is a big uh, milestone achievement in terms of pounds. Americans look at that. I know that our foreign uh, friends, international friends, often look at kilos in America. Unfortunately, we still use the imperial system. So 400, kilo, or 400 pounds is a big milestone deadlift, so she would like to hit a PB deadlift and possibly go over 400 pounds here. And of course, she wants to make the podium. If we don't write objectives here, occasionally we'll also write some cues or just helpful hints in terms of what our lifter might need to hear before they go out for the platform. But essentially, the remainder of the sheet is... Uh, left open and and that is what we're going to work on right now and that's what we're going to complete and I've done this for lifters three different lifters of different strength levels I've left a space over here where you can write in their rack heights which is convenient for squat bench and their safeties and then of course record their body weight so you have everything that you'll need to know you've got their lot number you've got their body weight so on and so forth and you record, can record all this information and literally have it in your hip pocket on game day and just work from here. And so this becomes a very good working document. I'm old school. I believe in having a hard copy with me at all times. Uh, I don't like relying on an electronic copy on my phone. What if your battery dies on your, on your uh, mobile device? What if you can't get a signal and access the sheet? There's a lot of things that can go wrong. I like to use my electronic copy as my backup and I'll, I will print this entire sheet at the end and have a physical copy with me and I typically will make two copies. One for myself and a backup or a spare in case I lose this one. But let's go ahead and begin to work our way through the worksheet and you're gonna see that I'm gonna do this as I said for, for lifters of three different strength levels. So we're going to assume it's looking like that she trained well, that she's arriving in top form and that she's healthy. And so the way that we configure the sheet is we start with the attempts and work our way back through the attempts and then we configure the warm-ups. We don't configure the warm-ups first because we want to know what the attempts are. So we are anticipating, because she squatted 145 for a single at 9, we're anticipating that she's going to be in line for an incremental PB here. So we're going to put in the cells that are highlighted in bright yellow represent our top end or high end numbers in each discipline. So we're assuming that she's going to be able to hit a PB here of 150 kilos. And if you just run the math, and again, that would be an incremental PB over the 147.5. So we do our calculations based on the current PB of 147.5 or 325 pounds. So when you start to run that math and you want to configure what these numbers are working our way backward, as I said before, the second attempt is typically somewhere between 95 and 97 percent. That's what the data say. That's what I've combed through in my data collection, um, 23 plus years, or I should say 22 years of data collection. And that's what the data say. So this is going to be 96 and a half percent is kind of our SSPT sweet spot. That puts us right at 142.5. And then we count back to the opener, which is circa 91 percent for us. So that would be a 135 kilo opener. So you see we've got a nice seven kilo, seven and a half kilo jump to the second one, followed by another seven and a half kilo jump. Now, assuming that this doesn't move as planned or it's heavier, we've got the bottom end range, which is 140 kilos. And likewise over here, I would probably just go ahead and put in the lower end of the range here. You'll see on some worksheets, uh, coaches put a C possibility. I, I don't really feel the need for that. Um, just respectfully, I have all the kilos memorized and very fluent in kilos. I know all the numbers by heart. And I don't necessarily see a place where you need to write in a 3A, a 3B, and a 3C. I mean, obviously, another attempt in here could be that she would tie the PB at 147.5. But essentially, I'm, I'm writing in the lower end of the range or the worst case scenario here. If the opener is tough, I mean, she's not going to jump two and a half kilos. She'd jump five. And then again, you know, she could jump five here. So anyway, those are some nice looking attempts. And then what we want to determine is the all important last warm up. So I told you in my uh, video on warming up that typically, uh, and this is my anecdotal experience and evidence over being in the sport for 28 years, typically the squat and deadlift 
carry a last warm-up of roughly 83%, give or take, right? And so what I'll do is, is I will just take this number. This is her current PB. This is what we're basing the attempts on. And I'll take that 147.5, multiply it by 83%, and it comes up to 122 and a half, right? Which is 270 pounds. But a lifter at this strength level is probably not going to want to jump 12 and a half kilos. So we're just going to make that a little bit easier, or I'm sorry, a little bit um, more pragmatic jump, and just make that a 10 kilo jump, right? And then we just work our way back through the sheet all the way to the opener, making these logical progressions to the bar. I'm sorry, working away from the last attempt to, to the bar. So if you notice, we've got the bar uh, and then 60 kilos, a 20 kilo jump, followed by a 17, a 15, a 12, and a 10 to the opener. And then we've got two seven and a half kilo jumps. Those make perfect sense. As I have always said, you take the repetitions, in terms of warm-up reps, you season those to, to taste like spices in a recipe, but suffice it to say this is a warm-up, not a workout. If you haven't watched my video on warming up properly, go back and watch that one first. But they would probably take somewhere between three and five here. Uh, this set is probably going to be somewhere between two and three. This might be one to two. And these will probably be singles, right? And look, if this lifter wants to just, you know, do three here, do two here, or they could even do singles all the way through, it really doesn't matter. It's whatever is just enough for them to prime their nervous system, get loose, acclimate the body as an organism for this opener. So that when they hit this last warm up, there's a nice progression there to the opener. But we're going to stick just for the sake of aesthetics and consistency here of something like that. We're going to click save at the top of our worksheet. And so we've got some nice, good, pragmatic squat attempts based on the training data as well as the PB and the goal, right? Let's work our way through the bench. Wonder Woman has an 82.5 kilo bench press PB. She hit that at her last comp, and in prep this time, she hit 80 kilos for a single at a nine. So she's really close Presumably that was not a you know max effort lift. Maybe she had one rep left in the tank, or maybe it was just a nine or an RPE scale. So we are hoping or planning for, we're expecting her to hit a PB at 85 kilos. And again, working our way back through the sheet. So if we take 82.5 and we run the math on 82.5 and we multiply it by about 96.5%, what do we get? We get 80 kilos, right? So if we took a five kilo jump from here to here, then likewise, we're gonna have about a five kilo jump there. And there's no need for a C attempt here because really these are either or numbers because the jumps are so small because it's a five kilo jump. I mean, if this is really hard, there's only one place to go, right? And that would be to 77 and a half kilos. And then likewise down here, the bottom end of the range would be something like that. It blows my mind how lifters at this strength level feel the need to take 2.5 kilo jumps through each uh, progression or each attempt, I should say. I've even seen it at meets like the Sheffield. Um, you can go ahead and look at the results, and I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus, but you have women who are benching almost 100 kilos, and they insist on taking 2.5 between each attempt. And what that tells me is that they are not confident. Uh, you know, they're taking these small itty bitty jumps using up too much gas in their tank, and just don't possess the confidence to jump the five kilos. My data collection has shown that once you get to about 65 to 67 and a half kilos, so in pounds, that's 143 to 148, that's right around the cutoff, that's where you can begin taking five kilo jumps in the bench press, because that's about roughly 5% between each attempt, and that is totally pragmatic. You don't need to rely on 2.5 itty bitty baby jumps. Your body can tolerate five kilo jumps. As a matter of fact, you'll save more energy and more gas in the tank. So what do we do? Likewise, we count back. What I've found anecdotally in the bench press is that the last warm up is best at about 85%. So again, working our way back through here, we've secured that last warm up at about 85%. 
And then we've made logical progressions. So after the bar, we're doing 40 kilos, which is a 20 kilo jump from, from the uh, bar to, to 40, followed by a 12, a 10, a seven and a half, and then a five to the opener. And then we've got five kilo progressions through the attempts. Likewise, in terms of repetitions, maybe they're doing something like that, right? Season these to taste. All right, you can do the repetitions any way you want. If you, if you prefer singles, just do singles, does not matter. Let's go to the deadlift, as I said, in the deadlift. So her prep went really well in the deadlift. You notice that her comp PB is 177.5, but she hit that in training in her last heavy session at an eight RPE. So there's a lot left in the tank. She really wants to cross this 400 pound hurdle. So we're gonna set it up for a potential 402 PB on the third attempt. And that would mean that the second attempt would be right there. And then likewise, the opener would be right there. So we've got not two nice 10 kilo jumps going to that 402 or 182 and a half. You could make an argument at this strength level to take a 10 kilo jump like that, followed by a seven kilo jump. Really, that's just gonna, you know, the math is like splitting hairs here. The opener is typically 91%. The second attempt for us is 96, 96 and a half. And the last one is just the incremental PB. So in theory, for this, for the conversation here, if we're setting this up for 402 or 182 and a half, then really we're not calling the attempts off of 177.5. In theory, we would be calling this off of a comp PB of 180. But we know that her PB is 177.5, but just for the math's sake, we're actually calling the numbers off of 180. But again, we're splitting hairs. So you really have to talk to your athlete and find what they're comfortable with. Personally, I kind of like the 10-10 approach in terms of the, the jumps. I think that anybody who's strong enough to pull about this weight can, can survive on 10-10. And furthermore, this is going to take just a little bit less out of them than the 175 kilo lift. So likewise, we just fill in the gaps here for the bottom ends of our range. It's not complicated. She can always tie the PB there. The last warm up in the deadlift is right around 83%. In this case, that's 150 kilos. And then again, we just work our way backward with pragmatic jumps you see. So she's starting on a red, which is totally within her wheelhouse given the strength level. There's no need for her to start with a blue. This is a red and a clip. And I highly recommend singles in the deadlift, right? Just spare energy up until the opener. And, and now this sheet, we click self, and assuming that Wonder Woman goes nine for nine, she's gonna land on a 417.5 kilo total, which is a really nice to PB total, seven and a half kilos over the 410, right? She did 402 in her last competition but she's actually at a 410, so that would be a really nice 7.5 kilo PB total for her. So that's what a game day worksheet looks like, and that's how the game plan installation process takes place for a female at this strength level. So let's click Save, let's click out of here, and let's go to our second subject, which lo and behold is Mr. Jason Bourne. So, he is competing at Raw Nationals, which is next month in September, right? The weight classes are different. He is also a male. He is in the open category. He's in the 90 kilo weight class. So I selected 90 kilos right here. He's in flight 2B, has a lot number of 11. Same thing here. The worksheet is blank. The PBs are written in place. His objectives wasn't strong enough to make the primetime session, but he wants to go nine for nine. He'd like to hit a PB total, and he would like to win his flight. So essentially, lifters who don't make the primetime session at USAPL Nationals oftentimes lift during the day. And so he feels like he's strong enough to just represent himself well and potentially take a shot at winning his flight. So they're going to group him in a flight with other lifters that are circa this total, and that's one of his objectives. But again, I don't need to kind of beat a dead horse here. But given the training data and giving the numbers, again, we're assuming that he's come in top form, that he's healthy, and we're going to set him up for an incremental PB. So if you just watch what we're doing here, 
I'm just going to fill this out in the same way that I filled out the previous sheet. And this is just based on the math and the data. So those are good first and second attempts. You've got a 15 kilo jump there followed by a 12. And so then we write in the lower end of the range. Again, I don't really see a need to have a C attempt. Uh, I just have a 3A and a, a, three a and a 3B. Likewise, the warm-ups, we just make pragmatic warm-ups. Again, always working our way back to the bar. We don't start at the bar and work our way up. But you'll notice these are really nice, clean jumps. So we've got a 50, a 40, a 30, a 27 and a half, followed by a 20 kilo, right? And these are, these are again, we just write these in, three to five, probably two to three here. But the lifter, again, as always, can auto-regulate these based on timing, based on feel, based on whatever they like. And those are really good looking attempts for somebody at this strength level competing at this competition. All right, has a 167.5 kilo PB in the bench, would like to take, or it looks like they're set up. I mean, they hit 167.5 in their last training session. Looks like they're set for an incremental PB here. So we're just going to work our way back based on math, based on data. And we know that somebody at this strength level can take a 10 kilo jump followed by a seven. And look, if they're a nervous Nelly and they don't want to jump 10 kilos, or you know, then, then this could be something like that. It could be a seven and a seven, but given their strength level, this is right around the strength level. The cutoff is about 165 to 167, where they can begin to take a 10-7, but it just comes down to preference. If they're comfortable only taking 7-7, seven, seven, then you can make a 7-7. Seven, seven. Jump like that, and then we fill in the gaps there, and this is going to look like that. Again, always counting backward, about an 85% last warm-up puts us at 142.5, which gives us a nice 10 kilo jump to the opener, and again, working all right backward, you see these are nice, easy progressions. A 20 kilo, a 20, a 17, a 15, and then a 10, right? Really nice. We can take these, we can copy and paste these over here, and that's kind of what the warm-ups are looking like. Likewise, in the deadlift, bigger deadlifter wants to hit a 650-pound deadlift, which is 295 kilos, so we work that way in there, and again, Populating the fields. Again, this is just based on math, based on data, based on taking an opener that is right around 91%, a second attempt, which is right around 96, 96 and a half. Look, if the math doesn't work out perfectly, that's fine. Round to the nearest 2.5 kilo increment. Then we fill in the lower end of the range. And down here in the deadlift, obviously everything is subject to change in the, in the last deadlift because they're going to be pulling for placing or pulling for a medal, or pulling, you know, just jockeying in general. And then, as usual, we go backward with our warm-ups. Jason Bourne is plenty strong to start with two reds. There is absolutely no need to start with a single red unless they've been sitting around for a long time, and as usual, really kind of prefer singles in the deadlift. Look, if he's a sumo deadlifter and he's been sitting around and he wants to, you know, grease the groove, you know, and loosen up, then yeah, maybe you could make an argument for them taking, um, you know, these types of warm-ups and doing it like that. And then maybe what you do is you, you, you let out the rope a little bit and you let them do, you know, one to five reps here. Just to loosen up, just to grease the groove, get the hips loose. But primarily, I would focus on these four warm-ups. This one is not necessary unless the lifter really feels like they need it because they've been sitting around for a while. All right? And last, but certainly not least, we're going to get into the big boys here with a stronger lifter. And who do we have? But none other than Dwayne The Rock Johnson. That's right. He's qualified for 2024. That's next year. IPF Worlds in Lithuania. So, again, we're just making this up. He's a guy. He's lifting in the 120 kilo class. He's going to be in the prime time session with a lot number of eight. And as you can see, this cat is really strong, right? He's got a big total of 965 kilos. You'll also notice that if we add together his comp PBs in each discipline, right, the 372, 40, and 375, 
we're adding up to a 985 kilo total, which is 20 kilos over his current PB, which he did in his last comp. So presumably, if he really puts his package together, puts his lifts together, he's going to be in world record total position. So Tony Cliff, as you know, is our reigning 2023 IPF world champion at 120 kilos, and The Rock feels like he can come in and challenge. Obviously, the objective at Worlds is always to win. There really is no other objective. If you're in the running, you want to win. There's only one day out of the year when you can become a national or world champion. PBs go completely out the window. It is all about maximizing your total, building the biggest total possible, and getting as high up on that podium as you can. PBs are secondary, sometimes tertiary objectives, icing on the cake, if you will. The objective is to win. Obviously, building the biggest total is going nine for nine. And oh yeah, if he puts his package together, he has a chance of breaking Dennis Cornelius's 978.5 kilo world record total. So, at this strength level, where you're squatting around 370 kilos and pulling about 375, right? This is a really balanced lifter. Man, squat and dead are really close together. We don't see that too often, but really super balanced lifter. Once you get to about this strength level, at about 375 kilos, the incremental PB can be actually 5 kilos as opposed to 2.5. They possess that strength level where they can aim for a slightly higher PB. So in this particular case, the squat prep has gone really well, finished on a double at 360 at about a 9.5 RP. We're going to set him up for potentially a 5 kilo PB at 375 kilos. And again, just working our way backward through the numbers, as we always do, this is what we have. We have about a 91% opener, 96-ish second attempt. And the range, obviously, for these lifters is a little larger. Um, you could, again, in theory, write in A, B, and C attempts. But, you know, it's, it's common sense to me that, you know, if it's, that there's other numbers in there. There's 372 and a half, you know, there's 70 and 70, uh, 372 and a half, 370, and so on. So, I mean, this could even be as light as an 804 number like that, which is a 365, right? But I just wrote it in as a potential 367.5. Based on this strength level, a 20 kilo followed by a 17, totally pragmatic, totally doable for a lifter at this strength level. As you begin to coach and become more experienced with lifters of this strength level, do not become intimidated by the jumps, all right? A 20 kilo jump for a lifter at this strength level represents about a 5% jump. That's the same for someone, you know, squatting 175 kilos and they take a 5% jump, it's gonna be around a 10 kilo jump. So it is what it is. A last warm-up of about 307. So again, that'd be a big 30 kilo jump, but doable at this strength level. And then again, as always, working our way back to the bar with nice, clean, pragmatic warm-ups here. So we've got them starting on 80 kilos, taking a 50, a 50, a 50, a 40, a 37 and a half, followed by a 30 kilo jump. And these warm-ups look fantastic. Probably going to do something along the lines of that. And that looks really good for a lifter of that strength level. It's not going to gas them out. Those are nice jumps. Again, this is not a training day. Go back and watch my warm-up video on how to warm up properly in competition. The, the game day arousal and adrenaline makes a difference. All right, setting him up for a potential incremental PB in the bench press. Now... I will say this, the bench press is its own different animal. And what I mean by that is the evidence and the data show that until you're benching about 600 pounds, even though the math says that you can jump, you know, when, you, when you're benching in the 500s, that you could jump in theory 12 and a half or 15 kilos, that typically doesn't end well. My strong recommendation is for anybody that's above a 200 kilo bench, but below a 275 kilo bench. So that's a big spread, 440 to 606 if you're counting in pounds. You should jump no more than 10 kilos and 10 kilos. 
when you do, when you decide to jump 12.5 or even 15 between attempts, while the math might say that you can, it typically doesn't end well. When you are holding a bar over your face at arm's length, just filling in the lower end range attempts, when you're holding a bar at arm's length over your face, it feels different than when it's on your back, like when you're squatting or in your hands here when you're deadlifting. 10 kilo jumps are about as much as you can do without experiencing significant negative side effects. Oftentimes it does not end well. So again, uh, just counting our way backward uh, to the bar, we've got a nice last warm up here of 207 and a half, which would represent about a 15 kilo jump to the opener. So if you run the math, right, this 222.5 is, as, uh, as a matter of fact, just showing the math here, it is about 92.7% of that. So in this particular case, we're opening just a stitch higher so that we ensure that 10 kilo, 10 kilo jump. All right, we don't want this number down lower around 485 or 479 taking a big jump. That'll serve to shock the nervous system with the weight in your hands like that. 10 kilo jumps are more pragmatic. So as always, working our way back to the bar, just filling in the gaps here. We've got nice clean warm-ups. These should be easy loads, most of them. Nothing complicated. 40 kilo jump, a 30, a 25, 22 and a half, a 20, and then a 15 to the opener, and then two 10 kilo jumps. Perfect, right? Again, auto-regulating the reps, but we just fill them in as a guideline. But the lifter can kind of take what they want as long as they're not doing, you know, five, 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 five all the way through and burning themselves out. Last but certainly not least, again, going to set him up for a five kilo PB in the deadlift, right? Definitely within his wheelhouse to take two 20 kilo jumps from 340 to 360 and then potentially 380 or whatever he's going to need to get on the podium to win, to secure this world record total, potentially. So the ranges are a little bit different, but working our way back, and I've got him taking five warm-ups. That's a nice, good last warm-up there at 310 kilos. And again, a lifter at this strength level is gonna have no problem starting at 130 kilos. Give me a break. They don't need to do a red, save the energy, and then as always, or I should say as usual, singles through the deadlift, saving as much gas in the tank as you can for the deadlift. The meat doesn't start until the bar hits the floor. So as we can see, look, if he makes all of his top end third attempts here, these three A attempts, that's going to add up to almost a thousand kilo total. A 21.99 at 997.5, that would be a perfect nine for nine day, which is gonna be well above the world record total at 978.5. But we're gonna click save on that. But as you can see, these worksheets all work the same. You can write in the lifter's name up here. It doesn't matter uh, what, what their name is, you know, John Smith, whatever, something generic, but I wrote in The Rock just for fun, write in the competition name here. Again, the weight class, You've got everything here at your fingertips. You're going to write in the rack heights, their body weight, all of these things, right? And having a physical copy in your hand enables you to make notes on this, to check off the warm-ups as you go, right? Just put a little check mark next to each one as you go through the squats, the benches, and so on and so forth. But this is how we install game plans. This is a collaborative process that we do on a virtual video call with the lifter and their particular coach who writes their programming. And we complete this process with coach and athlete. It is a collaboration. But this process works very well for us. And we feel that SSPT increases the probability of our lifters having success when it matters most, and that's on game day. So in conclusion, game day is the single most important day of the entire training cycle. As I said in my warm-up video, it is not the day to uh, simply fly by the seat of your pants. It's not the day to YOLO. It's not the day to just go wherever the wind takes me. 
Take the time, work with your coach, work with your athlete, install a pragmatic, a logical game plan that accounts for a variety of scenarios based upon your lifter's experience level, their strength level, and certainly the level of the competition. Have every single warm up and every single attempt written out, have plays called so that you can just adjust on the fly so that you're not having to call something spontaneously. You wanna have a play called when the proverbial crap hits the fan and your, your adrenaline's pumping and you only have 60 seconds to make a decision. So I certainly hope that this video has illuminated a path uh, that will help increase the probability of your lifter's success. As always, if you want to do a deeper dive, a more detailed dive into this topic and so many others, check out my game day coaching manual in the link below. I have an entire chapter, I believe it's eight pages long on game planning that goes into all of this in a great amount of detail. You can see it written out, you can see examples. I have more examples with various lifters of, of uh, various strength levels as well. I also have an attempt progression chart based upon all of the data and a lot more. So check that out uh, in my game day coaching manual. And as usual, Thank you so much for watching, and I wish you all the best of strength and skill.